Hey folks, my name is Chris Manson and you might know me online as Relate in most places. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Twitch, uh, the Ember Community Discord, all is Relate. But apart from GitHub, where I am, Mansona. Uh, that's because for some reason GitHub really don't like the underscore. So if anybody watching this knows anybody at GitHub that has the power to allow underscores in this form, please do get in touch. I will push that button as soon as it's allowed. Today I am talking to you about a process that you can adopt to improve your code base. That may sound very broad and vague, but it's actually true. The process isn't tied to any single technology. It isn't even Ember specific and you're already using parts of it, probably. Uh, there are just two things that I hope that you will take away from this talk that might fundamentally change your approach to improving any of your code bases in the future. At least that's my hope. And if I didn't quite convince you or I didn't quite explain it well enough, please do get in touch and let me know. I am personally on a constant journey to slowly improve how I communicate this process over time. And yes, that is a bit of foreshadowing for the content of this talk. So let's start our journey together with a bit of a story. You are a developer and you are pretty confident enough in your language of choice. We might be thinking JavaScript here since we're at EmberConf, but it could just as easily be HTML and CSS or if we wanted to go even more lo-fi, we could be talking about someone who writes exclusively in Markdown. But let's say that this developer in our story has been working on an established code base for a few months and they started to get to know it. Some of the nice bits that feel all slick and modern and some of the, the flaws and things that countless developers before them have vowed that they will come back to and fix but never did. Let's say our developer has been participating in this new process that their team is trying called code reviews, where a team member reviews their code before it's added to the code base. Remember folks, not every good practice that you believe in is truly universal. Trust me, I know that there are teams out there that don't even use version control. Anyway, our developer has begun to notice that everybody in the team keeps making this one mistake every so often. Not every day or even once a month, but often enough that there are quite a few files in the code base that this pr problem is going to be a bit problematic to work out and to find and fix all of the files that have it. Our intrepid developer has come up with a plan to fix this problem though. Step one in this plan is that they're going to start a rules document that everybody needs to follow when reviewing code. And on this rules document, they're going to make the first rule be, a bit, be about that mistake that they started to notice everyone making every so often. So let's, let's name this mistake so that we have a concrete example to think about. Let's say that it is people forgetting to add alt text on images. Generally, the developers on the team remember to include them, but sometimes the deadlines are a bit tight and the code reviews are a bit rushed. So a few cases have fallen through the cracks. But now that we have this rules document, we will double check that alt text on each and every image for all the new ones that are getting added. So that's step one in fixing this particular code base. No new images are going to be added without an alt text. But what about the cases that slipped through the cracks before we enforced our rules document? Don't worry, our developer has thought of step two and they've put together a plan for the existing issues in the code base. They don't actually have the time right now to stop everything and write a proper alt description for every broken image in the massive code base right now, but they have put together a list of all of the images that still need uh, alt descriptions and they've shared this list with the team. Now they're all going to slowly work together to fix the existing images over time alongside their existing work 
And not only that, to help motivate the team, our developer has even put together a little graph to show the progress being made as each image is fixed. Never underestimate the power of a graph. Now, I would suspect that everyone here at EmberConf will have picked up on my very thin allegory, but let's just spell it out in case anybody missed it. Our rules document is actually our linting rules. If you have ever worked on an Ember app, you will have experience with using linting because every newly generated Ember app has a whole plethora of helpful rules enabled by default and automatically baked into the default testing process. What I mean by that is that if you generate an Ember app and run npm test, you will automatically run all the pre-configured lint rules. And you know what? The rule in our example, alt text on images, is one of the lint rules that is automatically enabled for you. Thanks to Mel Sumner and the amazing work by the whole accessibility team, there is a whole host of accessibility rules enabled by default. So far, I probably haven't told you anything new. I'm trying to set the scene and hopefully make sure that everybody listening has a good foundational understanding of the purpose of a lint rule. Um, but there are two examples in my little story that I suspect a lot of people listening don't actually have embedded in their daily routines yet. Um, and these are two things are the ones that I said I wanted people to take away with them. So firstly, I said that our developer wrote a new rule in the rules document. Sure, our example happens to be one of the ones that comes with every new Ember app, but what if I gave a different example? What if I give you a real example that I recently worked on with a client and that I can not only guarantee there isn't a pre-written rule out there, uh, I will also say with some confidence that this rule will be of no use to anybody else. Uh, this client has a simple button component and they call it a UI button. It's like almost perfect naming for a component. Mwah, beautiful. Uh, for some reason, my uh, code highlighting here is removing the capitalization. I don't know why, but imagine there's capitals there. Um, so it turns out that we needed to change the CSS on the inside of this button just a little bit to make sure that the button gets rendered properly everywhere in the app. Uh, to cut the long part of this uh, story short, after this change, it turns out that we can't use the flex class on, you know, from Tailwind on this button anymore. So essentially that second version is now banned. Uh, the question now is, how do we turn this rule into a linting rule? So what even is a linting rule? I'm not gonna go super deep into the details here, uh, just because I'm not here for an hour long talk. Instead, I'll give you a bit of a conceptual overview and if you want to dig in any deeper, I would highly recommend a workshop that a colleague of mine did for EmberConf, I'm gonna say two years ago, maybe it was three years ago, I don't know what time is anymore. Um, it's all free and you can do it at your own pace. You just go to that link that I'm showing there on the screen. So let me give you a quick overview anyway. Uh, I said earlier that it's likely that you have, that you have lints baked into your testing flow. Um, when you submit a pull request, you will likely have broken the build if your lints have failed. I think that's an interesting thing that we've moved to be so rigid on linting in our daily development habits. It's useful in some regards, but it's also a bit problematic. Linting isn't a, it's not a functional thing. You're not testing functionality when you write a lint rule. You're asking a little program to read your code and tell you if it thinks it looks right or if it sees any mistakes. This is important because firstly, it's just a little computer program. It can get things wrong. And secondly, linting rules read your static code. It doesn't actually try to run anything. So it can't actually tell you when something is actually broken. It can just make suggestions uh, when it thinks something doesn't look quite right. Next up, we're going to look at what, it, what it's like to write one of these lint rules because 
as I was saying, it's a little bit different than writing functional tests. Uh, but before I do, I want to partake in a little bit of audience participation. So, can everybody raise their hands if you've ever written a test? Oh, hold on. I can't actually see your hands. So let's try this a different way. Hey, Twitter people, have you ever written a test? Okay, okay. This is a pretty substantial margin. Uh, for the last few holdouts there, uh, you got to try testing. It's pretty epic. Okay, next question. How many of you have ever written a custom lint rule that was specific for your code? Okay, okay. I'm actually quite impressed by this number. I knew that there was going to be significantly fewer people having written a custom lint rule, but I'm impressed that it's hanging around about the 30% mark. Hopefully I will inspire a few of you to try this out um, and we can bump that number up a little. So let's write a slightly simplified example of a lint rule together. I said earlier that there is that AST workshop and that will go into all of this in way more detail. But for now, we're going to look at an absolutely crucial tool to use for writing lint rules. AST Explorer. This is an incredibly powerful tool and it supports loads of languages. We just have to make sure that, see in the top bar there, it says handlebars and glimmer. Set those two right, because um, otherwise this can get pretty confusing pretty quickly. So you'll see that I've added our example from earlier on. UI button class equals flex. In, and that's on the left hand side, that's our code. And on the right hand side, you'll see the AST representation of that template. I'll not go into too much detail here about what an AST really is. Again, there's a workshop for that. Um, but you'll see why it's useful now in a second. One of the best tricks of AST Explorer is that you can just click the bit that you care about in your code on the left hand side and it highlights the bit in the AST representation of that bit that you just clicked. So there's a lot to see here, but I've clicked on the class itself, or I think, yeah, in fact, I clicked on flex in the class. And you'll see on the right hand side that we're inside an element node, and that element node has an array of attributes. And those attributes have a particular attribute node that is named class and has a value of flex. Okay, so hopefully you can see that on the right hand side. And um, if that doesn't, if that isn't a hundred percent clear, I would recommend just copying and pasting that example into the AST Explorer right now, because it's pretty cool. Um, so now that we have that in mind, that's all we need to find that class equals flex with our lint rule. So let's move on to actually writing a lint rule. Um, you can follow the instructions in the readme of Ember template lint. Um, and I think the AST workshop that I was talking about goes into more detail of this. But again, we're gonna skip ahead and we're gonna just use the example that they have in their readme, which is trying to find a comment statement. Um, I assume that that's useful to some people to be able to go and find comments in your code, but we're just gonna copy that structure and use it for our element node. So this is from what we saw in the previous example in the AST Explorer. We know that we're trying to find an element node. So we are returning a function called element node from this visitor function. Um, Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but this is a visitor pattern. Uh, essentially, it just means that that function called element node will be run every time we find an element in any of our templates. So what we need to do is we essentially need to find a specific element. So let's do that by putting a little if statement to check if the tag is UI button and ignore every other element. Then we will go through when we find a UI button and find any attributes that are named class. 
So we're just doing node.attributes.find where that name is class. Next, we check if that class attribute exists because we could have buttons in the system that don't have any class. And we check if the value of that class attribute includes the text flex. Um, and this is, this is it, this is the last bit. Essentially, we just need to complain to the lint system here. And this is gonna be different for every uh, lint system that you're using or every kind of lint rule that you want to write. But with Ember template lint, you just call this.log. Pass it a message. So try and be as descriptive as possible here. Help your developers if they come across this error. And uh, then you just need to pass in the node as well so that, say, if you're using uh, linting in your editor, it would know where to draw the little squiggly line. And that's it. It's been a bit of a whirlwind example, but I'm telling you now that although this is a bit of a simplification, because I'm leaving out a few edge cases, this is the essence of a simplified linting rule. Um, I hope that a few people watching will be looking at this and saying to themselves, wow, that's more approachable than I expected. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, this isn't a masterclass. I'm just trying to inspire or to encourage more people to try writing their lint rules. If I have inspired you to try it out, do let me know on Twitter. I'm always interested to hear when people are trying out things that I've talked about. So. Now that we've covered uh, that creating that lint rule, I want to um, I want to talk to you about the one of the other things that our developer story had, and they said that they wrote down a list of all the places in their code that needed to be changed and even put together a graph. So this is where the little tool that I built comes into the picture. And it happens to be the namesake of this talk. Oh, oh, it's getting away from me again. Lint to the Future. Lint to the Future was built to solve a very specific problem. And it's a remarkably simple tool. Let's talk about the problem first, and then we'll get into what the tool actually does once we understand the problem a bit more. So let's imagine that we have just written our don't use flex class on buttons lint rule and we wanted to enable it on our massive code base. We put it in the right place and configured it correctly and suddenly our CI system explodes and tell us, tells us that we've found a thousand lint errors across all the files in this giant code base. Turns out buttons are quite common web apps, who knew? Um, so I know I said earlier that lint uh, rules don't actually break things, but for better or for worse, our CI systems are usually set up to explode if even a single lint rule fails. So we can't just turn on the rule, commit it, and push it to master. Um, and it turns out that this particular rule isn't something that we can blindly fix. We can't just find and replace and remove all the flex classes because when people were adding those buttons, they added flex for a particular reason. And we need to go in and manually check uh, each of the buttons before we remove the class. So what do we do? One method that we might have done in the past would be to add the rule, but either configure our, but configure our system to just ignore it. So this doesn't really help us very much because we might as well have not added the rule if we're inst instantly going to configure our system to ignore it at all times. So there is another approach. Um, we can set, set the system to think of it as a warning and not an error. So that's what this looks like. <laughs> um, as you can see, it's not all that much different. The big difference here is that it isn't erroring at the end. So our CI system will allow you to merge your pull request but we've also just created, you know, a thousand lines of unmanageable comments and warnings. We can't really do anything with this. So 
we can either set our system to ignore it globally, or there's another approach if we want to improve things slowly over time. What we could do is we can use, uh, we can make use of a special uh, comment format that can ignore a particular rule in a particular file. So every lint system has one of these, every lint system that I've come across anyway. Um, you just have to know how to write one of these comments and what it needs to be formatted like. And in Ember template lint, it looks like this. Uh, template lint disable, and then the names of the rules. So what's the actual benefit of this? Didn't I just say that if you disable something, you might as well not have added it? Well, remember I said that um, we need to make sure that all new files in our example, in our developer example, all new files conform to this new rules document or the lint rule. Well, by setting up the file-based ignores like this as a one-time thing when we enable our new rule, <clears throat> that means that any new file that we create won't have these file-based ignores at the top of it, and they need to conform to the new rule that we've just configured. So you might think that this might be a bit tedious to find all the files and either add a new comment or add our rule to an existing comment, and I would tend to agree. And this is where the first feature of Lint to the Future comes in. Let's install it into our repo first. We just do npm install Lint to the Future and Lint to the Future Ember template. Um, this installs the main Lint to the Future package and the Ember template Lint plugin for Lint to the Future. It's a plugin based architecture, which is pretty useful. So now anytime we run any of the commands against Lint to the Future, it will know how to deal with files that are covered by Ember template Lint. So now that we've installed it, we need to make sure that we configure our rules so that the ones we want to ignore are currently failing. So in this case, we go back to our custom rule example that we had, and we see all of the errors there. Um, and we wouldn't be able to commit this, as I said, but we just run npx lint to the future ignore, and it will automatically add those file-based ignores to each of the files uh, that we've checked. So now you're ready to commit and push your work. This is a great first step uh, for enabling a new rule to your uh, code base. If the code base is still growing, then all the new files from this point will be just that little bit better from the way they were before. And now all we need to do is find something to do with our existing files. And this is where the second feature of Lint to the Future comes in, the dashboard. Uh, I planned to reveal the dashboard right at the end, um, but I couldn't condemn myself. I just had to show it here. Um, I'll show you a bit of a demo, just kind of navigating through it right at the end. But for now, we'll go into a bit of detail on how the dashboard works and how it gets its data. So in our example from before, we talked about this big list of files that needed to be fixed. Essentially, the fact that we are now using file-based ignores for Ember template lint or whatever other um, uh, plugins you're using is all we actually need to tell the system what files need to be improved. So in lint to the future, we have this little command that asks each of the plugins what the files are that have these file-based ignores. And if we just run npn mpx lint to the future list and st standard out just prints it out essentially, this is what the output looks like. Um, it's kind of cool. It's not the graph that I showed you a second ago, um, but it's interesting for one particular reason. You'll see the way that this output is actually structured. We have the date, which is when this was run, and then we have it grouped by each of the plugins, in our case, Ember template plugin and ESLint plugin, and then for each of the rules. And then, of course, you don't see the array, but that's just an array of the actual file name that has the file-based ignores at the top. Um, there's one more a command for Lint to the Future that's interesting, and it's the thing that actually outputs our 
lovely graphs. It is uh, lint to the future output and uh, dash O just tells you where to create the folder that it generates for you. So what that actually gives you, um, I'm just going to look inside the folder here. Um, you'll see that it's actually built a static web app for you. And you'll notice the, that there's also a data.json. Um, it happens to be the same as the output of list from before. So if you booted this static site up right now, you would see a set of graphs with exactly one data point uh, because it only knows about today when you ran it just now. If you want the app to do what it's supposed to do and allow you to track things over time, you need to tell it where to find yesterday's data by just passing in a link to the previous results. So if you ran this and then took a, another look inside the data.json, uh, you'll see that it's gone and downloaded yesterday's data. And you can go and take a peek at yesterday's data if you wanted to by just looking at that link. And it's merged it into the JSON with the output from the list command from today. And I think this is a pretty neat trick to allow you to keep track of your data using only a HTTP server and not needing a database. It means that you can even host your Lint to the Future dashboard on GitHub Pages without needing any other infrastructure. So on top of building into the future, I've built a little reusable GitHub action that allows you, that actually does the lion's share of all this work for you. So all you need to do is add this little snippet to a workflow document. Um, I know that probably looks a little bit small on your screen, but I couldn't zoom in because of the length of the link there. Um, I could probably rename the repo to be a bit shorter and then it would be uh, cleaner for demos. But uh, that's it. That's all you need to get started with Lint to the Future Dashboard if you wanted to try this process out. And if you've gotten this far, what does it actually give you? I've teased you with a screenshot, so let's go and do a quick demo. Um, I'm just kind of randomly <laughs> moving through the dashboard here. Um, few things to note. First of all, you'll notice that there's uh, awesome styling dark mode here. Uh, major props to Anne Kreth for this. Um, a little birdie tells me that she'll be talking a little bit about designing for dark mode, so watch this space. Um, you'll see that we have a graph for each of the rules that are failing. And you'll see that we have like a continuous graph from when it first uh, showed up to today. Um, that's it's actually filling in any gaps of days that you um, that you didn't run the process, um, which is pretty handy. Um, and you'll see that most of these graphs kind of started out in the month view. Um, that's just because there's so much data after it uh, after there's so much data, it just kind of defaults to monthly rather than daily or weekly. This is another uh, thing that Angreth. Uh, actually contributed, so thanks again for that. Um, and on, you saw me do it a few times there, but at the top of each graph, you have this view files link that you can just open and see which files need uh, still need improvement. Um, and that's it, really. Um, that's it for my talk. Uh, I hope I've given you a nice foundational perspective on what lints are or how useful they can be to actually unlocking improving your code base slowly over time. And if you're writing your own lint rules, that's just an incredibly powerful tool that will change your game a lot if you get into the habit of it. Um, don't forget to try out Lint to the Future, set up your dashboard and uh, tweet me if you do. And I'll leave you one thing, never underestimate the power of a nice graph. Thanks for having me.